brothers and sisters in Christ. Today is the first Sunday after Pentecost, also known as Trinity Sunday. In our worship service today, we focus on the fact that our God is three in one. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. May you have grace and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our sermon text today is recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. These words that I am commanding you today are to be on your heart. Teach them diligently to your children. And speak about them when you sit in your house, and when you walk on the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Tie them as a sign on your wrists, and they will serve as symbols on your forehead. Write them on the doorposts of your houses, and on your gates. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Glory to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three in one. To you, O blessed Trinity, be praise, now and eternally. May we receive great things from you today and always. Amen. My dear friends in Christ, every year we celebrate Trinity Sunday. It always falls on the first Sunday after Pentecost. Trinity Sunday is the day which concludes the festival portion of the church year and leads us into that long stretch of Sundays after Pentecost, which covers about half of the year. Celebrating Trinity Sunday is an old tradition. A few celebrated it as early as the year 1305, but it wasn't universally observed until 1334. At that time, the Christians felt that it was both wise and beneficial to set aside one special Sunday on which we emphasize what the triune God has done in the past and still does, both for us as well as in us. And so again today we will follow this 687-year-old custom as we look at three ways to worship the Trinity. Our text today begins with a passage which is known as the Great Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. The Great Shema is still used by the Jews today as a confessional statement of God's unity. Especially in the original Hebrew language, the word one resounds with definite finality. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. One. God is one. He is not divisible into separate forces, as the pagans try to do with him, designating a separate sun god and rain god and fire god and all the others. But rather, God is one the source of all natural phenomena. The heathen idols are mere copies, counterfeits, and not very good ones at that. Our text shows us very clearly that God is one, but interestingly enough, it also shows us that he is three. Didn't that first sentence sound a little repetitious to you? Why didn't Moses simply write, the Lord is one, or our God is one? I don't believe God uses a lot of extra words in his Bible just to impress us or to fill up a lot of space on a page. I believe that each and every word has significance and meaning. This opening passage in our text gives us a good example of that. It's a perfect statement for the doctrine of the Trinity, the triunity, when it says, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Only in theology can you get away with the statement that one plus one plus one equals one. Several other triple statements follow this first one, and we'll use one of them as the outline for today's sermon. We may worship God in three ways. First of all, as we let his commandments live in our hearts. Secondly, as we teach them to our children. And thirdly, as we show them to others by our example. The first way of worshiping God is a prerequisite for the others. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. 
These words that I am commanding you today are to be on your heart. It all starts right here with you and me and our personal faith. God himself has given us that faith and he wants us, he wants it to be strong. And yet so often our faith is weak, it's, it's not strong. Even though we are the people whom God provides with strength for our faith in his word and sacraments, we are the same people who eat too much and drink too much and smoke too much and work too much and play too much. We go against God's commandments every day, even though we know that God has given us those commandments for our safety and benefit. And yet in spite of all our weaknesses and shortcomings, God still loves us and he gives us every reason to respond to him with our love. In the Old Testament, God tried again and again to get that loving response from the Israelites. He chose them to be his special people. He delivered them out of bondage in Egypt. He provided them with food and water and clothing for 40 years in the wilderness. And he even drove out the other nations from the Promised Land and gave it to the Israelites as their inheritance. But the desired response was hardly ever there. And even when it was, it was still only a half-hearted love toward God's commands. Unfortunately, we're not much different. God has done just as much for us as he did for the Israelites, if not more. As Jesus himself told Nicodemus in today's gospel, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And all God wants us to do to thank him for this wonderful gift of his Son is to love him, to love him with untainted sincerity, to love him with all our heart. He wants us to love him without any reservations, to love him with all our soul. And he wants us to love him using everything we can muster, to love him with all our might. But we don't, because we can't. And yet it's not as if we don't love God at all. We do, we, we love him very much. That should be obvious. If we didn't love God, we wouldn't even be here to worship him. We wouldn't bother to attend the Lord's Supper. We wouldn't invest any time in reading and studying his word. We wouldn't bring our children to be baptized into his kingdom. And we certainly wouldn't go through all the expense involved in teaching our children about Jesus through our system of Lutheran schools. But the triune God is important to us, and we want him to be important to our children too. Needless to say, that's also what God himself wants. He says, teach them, that is God's commandments, diligently to your children, and speak about them when you sit in your house and when you walk on the road, when you lie down and when you get up. So what does it mean to teach our children diligently? Well, it doesn't mean just teaching them a little bit here and there. After all, what does it mean if you are a diligent golfer, or a diligent bowler, or a diligent hunter, or a diligent fisherman? You don't just do it once in a while or here and there, but rather you go all out for it and you do everything you can to be involved as often as you can. That's what God means when he says, teach my commandments diligently to your children. God's commandments should leave an impression on our children. Anyone who's ever helped to make sugar cookies knows what an impression is. When you push the cookie cutter down into the soft dough, it leaves a picture, an impression, and it doesn't go away. That impression gets baked right into the cookie. Children are very much like soft dough. They are impressionable. Something is going to leave that deep impression on them, and God wants it to be his commandments. However, if we don't take the time to be at home with our children, and to talk about God's commandments with them, something else might leave its impression on them first. If that should happen, and it often does, then our only hope is that this bad impression hasn't yet been baked in. Then we would still be able to reshape the dough and start all over again from scratch. However, bear in mind that once the dough has been baked, 
it becomes inflexible. And then if you try to reshape it, it crumbles. And finally, God would have us take his commandments beyond the borders of our family. Our text concludes, Tie them as a sign on your wrists, and they will serve as symbols on your forehead. Write them on the doorposts of your houses and on your gates. The Jews interpreted those words very literally, and as a result, they developed the practice of wearing phylacteries. A phylactery is made up of Bible passages rolled up and placed into a tiny box, which is then tied onto the back of the hand or on the arm or on the forehead. This was usually done during the time of the morning prayers and served as a reminder of God's love and promises and commands. Sort of like when you tie a string around your finger in order to help you remember something. But actually God had something a little less literal in mind with these words. He simply wanted us to remember his love and promises and commands so that these things would show in our lives. Notice how God wanted his commandments to emanate out from the individual. He told them to tie them on their wrists and forehead, on the doorposts of their houses, and even on their gates, probably the city gates. In other words, they were to let everybody know that they were believers. And that's what we're to do as well. Let everybody know that you are a Christian. Live your faith in your home, in your neighborhood, in your town, and everywhere else as well. That's what we're doing right now as we worship the triune God. That's what we're doing every time we receive the Lord's Supper. Whenever we gather together as a group of Christians, we are showing everyone around us that Christians can have a good time by following God's commandments rather than by breaking them. Christians can enjoy life without arguing and fighting and overindulging. And hopefully that attitude stays with us at all times. Always keep God's commandments in mind so that whatever we do, it may be done to God's glory. Practice those three ways to worship the Trinity. Keep his commandments in your heart, teach them to your children, and show them to others by your example in society. Amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. O almighty and everlasting triune God, God the Father who made us, God the Son who redeemed us, and God the Holy Spirit who regenerated us, we thank you that you have revealed yourself to us in your holy word as the one and only true and living God. Without this revelation of yourself, we would be ignorant of you and would become completely guilty of worshiping false gods. Help us like Nicodemus of old to diligently seek the truth that we may know more about you, your will, and your marvelous dealings with mankind. Amen. And Lord Jesus, on this Memorial Day weekend, we thank you for all those who have sacrificed their lives in service to our country. Be with the families who grieve over the loss of their loved sons and daughters, who went to war and did not return. Comfort them with the knowledge that in Jesus we have victory over death and the promise of a future reunion in heaven. Make us always thankful for the freedoms we enjoy in our country, freedoms which were purchased at such a great price. Amen. We join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen.